Well, at this point in time, we have to have suspicion of the disease or, or the disorder in order to do the testing. So what um, signs or symptoms would you use to key you in toward the need to proceed with testing for spinal muscular atrophy? Thoughts? Oh, yes. Uh, well, it depends on the age of presentation, mm. right? Because infant onset, the babies will be very floppy and typically will have, in addition to hypotonia, they'll have weakness and they'll have difficulty with breathing and ultimately with swallowing. Uh, babies that are intermediate might just have some motor delays and then develop uh, more severe weakness. Um, and then children with the type 3s that oftentimes are late in diagnosis may have clumsiness of gait and frequent falls and not be identified until later. So those are some of the aspects that you look for early on in terms of trying to make a diagnosis. Mm. Looking at those earliest onset patients, I really think of areflexia and tongue fasciculations as being the red flags to look for. Um, and I think it's important to think about in the type 2s and type 3s or the later onset that they may still have some reflexes, but they can kind of be significantly decreased um, because I think sometimes people are looking for the pure absence of reflexes um, and the presence of them can sometimes lead them astray in the diagnostic evaluation. Quite true, but tongue fasciculations and dysphagia are somewhat late findings, but the areflexia is a very early finding, especially in the legs with the floppy frog legs. I think those are some of the early presentation that we've identified in our pre-symptomatic early identified children, mm -hmm. infants when they start to develop symptoms. And a lot of SMA has what we kind of see in other neurodegenerative diseases that kind of strike early on in development where there can kind of be an overall normal developmental trajectory for a period of time, often with some delays early on, uh, but it's that plateau in the regression that really kind of present to red flags. Although as we talk about the new treatment options, I think we'll also have to talk about how we have to have a higher index of suspicion to think about these diagnoses earlier. Mm -hmm. Would you have any um, other thoughts that we should throw in about really key findings that you've experienced over the years that help you with picking the children with SMA out of the yeah, um, broader differential? The, um, uh, qu quite often you have um, an infant or, or you're somewhat older child where uh, you have weakness in hypotonia and the question is does the child have SMA or has, let's say, uh, a myopathy. And uh, looking at the face is very, very important because uh, most of our patients with SMA, at least early on, they have a very expressive face. And the reason is that there is preservation of the innervation of the facial muscles. So that's something that I usually uh, discuss with the, with the residents they don't have that myopathic phase we see with, say, with congenital myopathies. Right. Okay. For older onset, later onset SMA, uh, the neurogenic tremor, the mini polymyoclonus, is oftentimes overlooked and not attributed to SMA. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an early sign that sometimes is overlooked. And the other thing I try to remind people of is particularly in the type 3s, they may have a slight elevation of CK and also not to kind of be completely led astray with that. It would be un very unusual to have a CK higher than 1,000, uh, but certainly a slight elevation can be common in those patients who are still ambulatory. Any other thoughts about um, differential diagnosis? So I think it's a little bit challenging to talk about differential diagnosis about a disease that has so many different phenotypes and looking at kind of the broad severity because the differential is very different than if you're talking about an infant who's coming in at three to four months with severe hypotonia mm -hmm. than if you are talking about a six-year-old who's coming in with an increase in falls and problems getting up the stairs. Um, so the differential really kind of can be quite broad. Uh, I think it frequently boils down into really trying to kind of elicit the actual weakness very early on, particularly when you're evaluating children whose primary concern is low tone, um, and really trying to kind of evaluate how you're going to look at the weakness in these young, often non-compliant patients uh, that we're seeing. And so trying to get a grasp at their anti-gravity movements, at their functional movements by having them climb stairs, get up off the floor, I think are really important clues in looking at things. Mm -hmm. um, 
as you kind of go down the diagnostic pathway, I think particularly with SMA type 1 who are presenting symptomatically, uh, they often can have such a classic phenotype. If they do have, they're more likely to have the tongue fasciculations at present and to have areflexia, that jumping directly to genetic testing um, is often indicated. In a lot of the older children, it can be a little bit more difficult and they may go through a little bit more of a diagnostic journey. But that's a good point that if you're not sure of an infant with hypotonia, it's best to test them for SMA because you need to identify that early. And then you can address the broader differential diagnosis if it turns out that it's not SMA. It can get confusing when we have uh, a child with proximal weakness who happens also to have uh, some degree of CPK elevation, as you said earlier. And sometimes uh, patients who have type 3 SMA, they can even have a little bit of calf pseudohypertrophy. So uh, the uh, possibility of muscle disease mm -hmm. comes up. Um, and um, uh, in some of these cases when, um, uh, particularly uh, when there is some urgency, perhaps doing electromyography, uh, might be useful mm -hmm. uh, because the EMG findings uh, in SMA are very, very uh, typical. Uh, but I have to say that we're not doing a lot of electromyography these days outside of the ICU setting. It's sort of unusual to do electromyography. Um, and most of the time, as you said, we just send the DNA test, uh, trying to make the diagnosis excluded. 